I don't know what I did to uh, the Healthcare Now staff for them to put me first thing on Sunday morning, but <laughs> I'll find out. <laughs> I is, uh, <clears throat> am not known as a morning person, so this, uh, this ought to be interesting. <laughs> so uh, we have a handout. Katie's uh, got it. Um, I think um, Al's offered to help pass it out as well. I, I want to um, talk about uh, the healthcare uh, legislation that the House passed and uh, compare it to uh, the Senate bill, talk a little bit about um, where we're going, uh, where I think we can go legislatively, and uh, really kind of do a lay of the land, because as we talked about last night, we are in a unique position. Uh, we are not... Um, uh, obviously the only folks working for health care reform in this country, but we are the uh, only group of activists who are really critical of the legislation. And that sometimes puts us in a tough spot because uh, the folks that we worked with maybe 20 years ago, uh, you know, Miriam and I, Quentin and others, uh, you know, most of those folks went over to uh, the public option, frankly. Um, and so I want to spend a little bit of time, and we've got a piece in the handout comparing single payer to the public option. Um, and we've also, uh, in the situation where major, as you all know, major institutions uh, in the progressive community move on, campaigns for America's future, uh, AFL-CIO, Change to Win, SEIU, uh, formed Healthcare for America Now, and that group, um, is still uh, supporting this plan. And then, of course, Organizing for America, the Obama uh, political operation, uh, we were talking about at the board meeting. Uh, how many of you know that they did 300, over 300,000 calls into Congress? Right? 300,000 calls into Congress. What, you know, in the course of a couple of days, what was the message? Healthcare can't wait. <laughs> Healthcare, oh yes. That's great, I love that. 300,000 calls, we're gonna mobilize this vast constituency because healthcare can't wait. You mean healthcare now? Yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit different, Kevin. Um, so, uh, but yes, they basically they basically ripped off all of our ideas and then turned them into something else, right? I mean, that's, that's in some ways the story of, of, uh, of the year. And as I said last night, we, we found ourselves in a situation where the White House was a major player behind the scenes. So a couple things I want to uh, talk about first, where we found ourselves in that last end game around um, the Kucinich Amendment and the Wiener Amendment. And uh, we, we talked some about this. Essentially what it looked like was is that, uh, as you know, Congress uh, Member Wiener had a commitment from Speaker Pelosi to have a floor vote in the House on H.R. 676. He then submitted it to CBO for scoring. Uh, there are a lot of machinations around that scoring. Uh, you may not know <coughs> that that score came out very badly uh, for HR 676. I mean, really badly. And not because it was a well done analysis. It was a badly done analysis where essentially they said, okay, we're gonna put all the healthcare spending under this proposal, but we're actually not going to accrue any real savings, really substantial savings to the single payer model. Uh, and so it came up with uh, um, just a very flawed analysis in terms of revenue and expenditure showing about a $10 trillion shortfall over 10 years. And PNHP's done a very good uh, critique of that score, but that certainly uh, played into and was used by those opponents who didn't want to bring single payers to the floor. Also, there was a move by senior members of the Progressive Caucus to the speaker not to have the Wiener Amendment voted on. And so that was a situation we found ourselves in where we did not have a real, really a strong consensus within the Progressive Caucus to bring Wiener to the floor, though it had been our, our movement demand. And then of course, at the last minute, um, Congress members Kucinich and Conyers put out a letter saying they didn't want it to go to the floor either. And so it was a very uh, odd uh, dynamic there at the end. And I think what the only way to really explain it is that there, the White House was in the background uh, with the Speaker, not wanting uh, 
their bill, their reform proposal to be tainted by the government run uh, uh, attack that they felt would open the door. At the same time, uh, th that a floor vote would open the door for. And then at the same time, the Kucinich Amendment was pulled out by Henry Waxman and George Miller and the Speaker as they prepared 3962 to go to the floor. And that was done ostensibly for two reasons. One, because they thought it was a poison pill would cost them votes. And uh, secondly, because uh, there was obviously some, some opposition from, from major, um, major employers, right? Because the Fortune 500 had weighed in against them. What we think, though, uh, is that, again, there was an effort by the White House not to have that provision in the bill. And we are not uh, going to rest there. And so there are two things that we're going to do. Number one is that Bernie Sanders is going to bring his version of single payer to the Senate floor. Right? Now, he's, he's uh, the actual uh, particulars of that, whether it's going to be a version of H.R. 676 or his 703, I don't think is finally decided, but we're going, to have a, we're going to have a fight in the Senate. Secondly, Senator Sanders is trying to figure out a way, as you heard uh, Dennis Kucinich say in the, in the video, to help get that ERISA waiver back into the bill in conference. And there may be a Senate strategy to do that as well. Right, where, because you know, these individual senators have quite a bit of clout since they need every vote, literally every vote of a Democrat, or in Sanders' case, an independent that they can get. He has enormous clout. So he's going to then do an effort to get that provision in the Senate bill or have a vote on that provision in the Senate bill to set up a conference effort. So we're, you know, ironically, after all this time and after all this opposition from the White House, having been completely lied to and, and manipulated by the House leadership, we're still in the game, right? And that's not, um, that's not because uh, the, the leadership wants us to still be in the game, right? <laughs> this is not, uh, how do you, you know, they're not, uh, they're not happy about it necessarily. But every time they think we've got to stop legislatively, we find another little you know, opening uh, to, to run through. And so it's, it's a fun dynamic uh, in some ways. Uh, <laughs> if this is your idea of fun. Um, but at the same time, yeah, right, if, if you're a masochist. Um, <clears throat> that it is early in the morning, isn't it? <laughs> but but the, the fact is, is that these are essentially kind of legislative uh, moves, right, that give us an organizing opportunity. And that's really the point. That's really the bottom line, is that we now get uh, the opportunity to put some heat on the senators, right? Because these guys, I mean, <laughs> if the House members are insulated from the popular will, uh, you know, these guys have got, you know, R30 insulation that they just, you know, run around with to, to keep them away from the people's interests. and. Um,